Record. Three, two, one. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever we're at in the U.S. and around the world. Welcome to the show today. We are thrilled that you can join us. And special thank you to ESPN Honolulu for joining us. We really appreciate it. And folks, before we start, don't forget, go to BaseballOutsideTheBox.com, the audio. Just subscribe, show it, uh, and share it with everybody. And then also YouTube, Peter Caliendo. And don't forget, because of you, we're in over 100 countries with players, coaches, and parents listening to the show. And it's all because you help us out. So really appreciate it. Listen, today, exciting show. And I'll tell you why. I've been trying to get this guy on, and he is so busy. He has done so much for the game of baseball. Uh, first of all, he's the founder and CEO of Pro Program 15, which I want to really talk about. It's an exciting program. He's also the president of baseball operations for New Balance Future Star Series. And he's got a tremendous background in professional baseball, all levels. You're talking about player, hitting coach, scout, and, and cross-checker. So he has done it all. I'm not going to go into all his bio because we're going to put it on the show notes. You're going to hear how good this guy is. He's on TV. He's got his own podcast. And we're going to talk about evaluating players and some of the things that we may be doing wrong in evaluation of the players. So let me welcome quick to the show, Jeremy Booth. What's up, buddy? Hey, man, listen, I really appreciate you having me. And thank you for that introduction. Uh, I mean, you know, it's all uh, it's all baseball and it, it's all uh, it's all it's all network and brotherhood and doing what we can for the game. But um, I appreciate you having me today. Well, you know what you uh, we talked offline a little bit and, you know, we've got a lot of friends in common. I follow you on social media. It's amazing. All the programs, all the things you're doing. I know your main two focus is program 15 and also the New Balance program. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of showcases, evaluation programs, and I get it. Baseball's, you know, it's a good business, right? If you do it well, um, you run it well, you do the right thing. You know, it's a business, just like if you go to a dentist or anywhere else. Sometimes we are criticized because you say, oh, you're making money on baseball. Well, wait a second. Uh, yeah, we're making money on baseball. I do too, but we're giving some really good services. I want you to address that first, and, one, and then I get into the heart of the program. You know, Peter, you understand what it's like. You've been around this forever, you know, internationally, domestically, you know, uh, other countries, places I haven't you know, been to, only heard of as far as baseball. I mean, you've been in the ground and with the grassroots of this for a long time. Um, you know, when, when I left Seattle, which is my last major league organization, I mean, the whole point of this was to take what we were doing and not doing in a major league organization development wise and apply that to amateurs. You know, when it comes to, return on investment, when it comes to uh, events, when it comes to, you know, players and achieving, and all of us have been in that position from a player standpoint and trying to achieve goals. It's about role value. It all comes down to role value. It comes down to, you know, um, what, how much, what's your impact going to be with the club? You know, how much can they help you win? I mean, even analytics now and advanced analytics, we start talking about war and F war and how to quantify it, right? Replacement level. And all that stuff really means when you boil it down is how can you help me win and how much can you help me win, right? Um, I believe that some of the other things that have been out there, and I'm not going to name anybody individually, it doesn't matter, collectively in the youth baseball world has gotten focused on, uh, you know, things that are just, uh, how do I say this, window dressing. Right. We talk about exit velocity. We're talking about arm. I mean, that's great. Like that's all sexy and measurable. And man, it sounds good. But if you can't play and, and you're, those type of things don't match up to what your your tool set says, says it should be. Uh, if your skill set is underdeveloped and you can't translate those tools into skills, which has to happen at some point, you know, then you're in a situation where you don't have any value. And the whole point of what we wanted to do was to help players understand themselves earlier give them a, a charted pathway through major league professionals and, and people who have done this in the game uh, at, at high levels uh, who actually care about giving back and tying that together to give them a pathway forward that gave the family and the players some return. Yeah, I felt that way you'd be better for the game. I felt the players would have a better opportunity to succeed in major league baseball, college baseball, or even be better men as a whole, um, better citizens. And now, and now we've got some, some, some young women involved in what we do, uh, helping them be better people and, and achieve. And it's really all about giving back and, and how to make these players the best they can be. Yeah. And you brought up a great point, the financial obstacles. I read about that. 
Um, there are a lot of financial obstacles in baseball and, you know, for young kids to develop. I mean, and there's, you know, I love the travel programs because they get a chance to play, you know, at high levels, let's say, but it's expensive um, and it's tough. And you've made it um, where young people have that opportunity and they, you know, with, they don't have to spend as much money to be able to be developed and be seen. You know, on, on the pro side, we spend a lot of time, um, you know, in the amateur side too, certain people like yourself spend a lot of time talking about families having to make life decisions for baseball. You know, I, I get this visual in my head of, of mom and dad, you know, doing everything they can to spend tens of thousands of dollars for their family to have these kids achieve and sitting at, the, at a gas pump kind of making decisions. You know, do I want to put gas in, in my tank or do I have to go pay for this lesson? And it shouldn't be that way. It just right. shouldn't be that way. There, there are other ways to do it. You don't have to do it like that. Um, we found a model. Yes, there, there, there's some free components to what we do. There are some paid components to what we do. A lot of what we do is focused on eligibility, being consistent across the board, not wanting to sacrifice, um, have a player sacrifice his goals or his or her goals for the future um, because of money. So we want to make sure we reach people that way. Uh, but it's, it's far less than, you know, as far as collectively than anything else that's out there, we make sure we consistently do that. Um, you know, our day in the sun has been had, right? I mean, it's just, it's been had. And, uh, you know, from a valuation standpoint and from a, a human standpoint, we want to make sure nobody's left behind when it comes to whether or not they can play or not. We want to make, because you know, look, it must be, I mean, we're being honest, 1% of the 1% is going to get as far as I did. And 1% of the 1% is going to get, you know, 10 years in the big leagues and beyond, right? So to, 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 to think that everybody's going to get there isn't going to happen. But there's a lot of lessons that, learn, that are learned in baseball, resiliency, consistency, dedication, commitment, honor, um, that we need to impart on our youth whether they're eight years old, 14 years old, 17 years old. And uh, we want them to have something invested in it, but also for families to be able to be families too. Yeah, and it's important that we reach them. You know, you're talking about development. It's important, everything we talk about on the show, um, it's so critical that it's you reach them at the younger levels because you create the good habits, right? Because by the time they become 15, 16, 17, those habits are tougher to break. Yeah, you know, we talked with New Balance about that because, you know, New Balance pretty much jumped on right away. I mean, we, we spoke with, uh, I, just, I mean, full disclosure, we have a lot of, you know, we talked about all those mutual friends we have, you know, before we went with New Balance Baseball, you know, we talked with USA, right, about our formula, about how we were going to do this, about an overhaul to the NTIS system, uh, about better system of player evaluation, just things that we thought we could do better. Biggest brand should be the biggest brand, how we could go better. And New Balance jumped on and said, no, no, we're going to do this. We're going to go ahead and go forward. And, um, you know, they've been what I would call a founding partner. Um, wow. They ended us, you know, uh, well into the 2020s. You know, I mean, we are, we are, you know, one in, one in the same with New Balance Baseball and their Major League Baseball uh, department. So, um, you know, when you're, when you're getting to, to uh, development and growth, we didn't want to do anything under 13 years old because, I mean, you get one shot to be eight and nine and 10 and 11 and 12, right? I mean, you got to be a kid. And as long, it's really all about, fun, you know, fundamentals and foundation at that point. Um, I mean, we got guys in the big leagues that can't play catch. You know that. We got guys that can't play catch. So if we're doing that in Major League Baseball, I mean, how are we going to expect a nine-year-old to be perfect? Let's let's allow these kids to be kids and run around. And, and, and you know, we used to, what was it, stick ball? We used to have, like, water balloon fights. And I know that's way back in the day. But you only get one shot at that. Let those kids be kids. That's and let them have fun. Right. Turn that off and go play basketball and soccer and football, yeah. if you whatever it is you want to do. Um, by the time you get to 13 or 14, the focus tends to change. Some players will keep wanting to play all three sports. They're gifted enough to do that. They're interested. A lot of players will eliminate that to two and even more will now eliminate that to one just because of the mental aspect of where they want to go. It's not even the athletic part. It's the, that players today are, 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 focusing earlier mentally on what they love and what they want to achieve at, right? So we start at that level. And at that level, it still is foundational. It's arm for pitchers. It's arm action. It's delivery. It's execution. It's enforcing fastball command at that level, mm -hmm. right? Forget the breaking ball introduction. Let's, let's knock that off. It's fastball command. Let's develop, you know, good hand speed. Let's talk about uh, the foundational components of that. Then let's advance it. You know, one of the best pitching coordinators I was ever with was Jim Rooney. And he may, be, may watch this and may see it later, but, you know, Jim uh, was a national cross-checker as a pitching guy for the Brewers, and he was a pitching coordinator over there when I was there as well. 
And man, he was one of the smartest guys when it came to building a pitcher. Everything he ever said, I took that to heart. And so with our pitching coordinators now, Stephen Randolph, formerly Diamondbacks and Dodgers and um, I pitch in Japan, Yankees, we apply those same type of principles. When it comes to hitting, we're talking about feet and we're talking about athleticism in the box and we're talking about freedom and we're talking about absolutes. We're not trying to recreate it from such an early age. We're trying to build um, implement building blocks so they can kind of become themselves, right? And so I think at the younger levels, they need to be more focused on that as opposed to how far they're going to hit it or whether or not the exit velocity says 87. Or, I mean, who cares? Let's focus on the other stuff. Yeah, I agree. Wow, love the program. And here's the here's the part I'm interested in. In the program 15, what's that? Tell the folks, what's it look like in these programs? When they, a player shows up, um, what are some of the routines you're going through? Uh, is there stations, there's games, all that kind of stuff. What, what goes on through an event? So, you know, we, we have two things. We have program 15, um, which the name is derivative of my upbringing in Southern California. Uh, you know, there's a documentary on Amazon called Harvard Park. And mm. you may have seen it. It's got Eric Davis and Chris Brown and Daryl Strawberry. And all those guys used to go out to inner city LA and work out. You know, well, my, my dad, you know, he grew up in Linwood, California. My mom's from, from Compton. And, you know, after Compton College, he went to UCLA and then he moved on to Hastings Law. By the time he got through Hastings Law uh, in Northern California, you know, some of his friends were getting to the big leagues. And so they needed, he's, my father's an attorney, so they needed an agent, right? So they went into my, they tied into my dad. Uh, my dad went back and helped some people. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, he had a career as an agent when I was a young kid. Well, that introduced me to a lot of people running around in major league clubhouses from the time I knew where I was. Um, and I grew up in what they called the program. Now the program had all those guys I mentioned, plus Barry Larkin and Frank Thomas. And all of a sudden it grew to this thing that was national where people would descend on inner city LA for a couple of weeks before spring training every year. Um, so when I started this, it was a nod to that lineage. It was a nod to the values that they had. It was a nod to um, growing up with um, that as a background. And of course, 15 that you may see behind me on the wall was my Jersey number, right? So, you know, that, that kind of is how that came together. Um, but we start off with, with discipline, you know, if you're on time, you're late. Players got to be there early. We talk about having energy to be out there. One of my biggest things is we can't, we, our staff can't have more energy than you. We just, we can't, our days are over. We can't be out there wanting worse than you do. You got to be excited to come to the ballpark every day. Uh, we go through dynamic, dynamic stretching. We'll go through uh, in the hitting component. We'll go through stations. We'll go through workups and buildups. We'll go through swing absolutes. We'll talk about analytics. We'll discuss it, give them some analysis back. Uh, John Moscott, who works with Blast Baseball, who was a former big leaguer, going to the Olympics with Israel this year, is one of my first, uh, we'll call it family member lessons, if you will. Um, and John does a lot of our analysis there. So, uh, you know, we tie all that together for them in a comprehensive development day. There's a sim game component, weather permitting. Sometimes we do a two-day event. Um, but everything we do, even if it's just throwing a bullpen, even if it's execution in the cage, has a development and structural component. Sometimes it's collective, sometimes it's individual, but the day tends to fly by and we make sure at the end of the day, these players are able to articulate what they learned on that particular day. Now, from there, Pete, it's designed to take what you learned that one day, plus your major league scouting report you get back, along with the development feedback, and advance that over the next couple of months. We'll see you next two, three months down the line. You stay in touch, send us videos, we'll get back together with you. If you're a travel program, it's a partner, we work together with the travel program to make sure things are happening that way on the, on the, on, on the ground level. Um, and then we see again another event and we advance you every time we see you. If we can't advance you, it's because you have put the work in. That's now, it, that's now gone to some cognitive testing. That's gone to an athletic formula that we've designed that gives you a true athleticism score that can also help predict your role. Uh, and now we've added Becky Twombly, who's a dietitian with the Angels and the Lakers, to be able to tie in these players' nutrition, if they choose to use that, to help them be the best performance athletes they can. So that's the program 15 side, right? Wow. So you have to be selected into this. You can't just sign up. We're not, and I will say this, we're not some of the other people who can do that with Prep Baseball Report, Perfect Game. They're different models, right? right. For us, you have to be selected in, um, you know, character, athleticism, education, all things that have to do with who you are. Uh, as, as, as more than as much or more as what you do on the field. Uh, and then, of course, the Future Star Series events or the events. That's what we put on. And that's that fun road that ends up in Lake Charles, Louisiana and, and in, in Fenway Park, which, as you well know, is a cathedral when it comes to baseball. Absolutely. That's the showcase. Some major players there. Yeah, we've had some players go through there. We had some some uh, some money, if you will, on the bonus side go through. 
Um, and there's some guys that didn't sign who were excellent people. One of my favorites who didn't sign is at LSU tearing the cover off the ball right now is Dylan Cruz, right? Well, yeah, matter of fact, small world, Dylan played for me internationally in the Dominican Republic. There you go. Yeah, I mean, Dylan and his family, great people. Uh, Michael Brooks, who's at UCF, uh, great kid, great family. Um, you know, uh, we had some other guys that signed who were off the radar at the time. Marco Raya in the fifth round of the Twins. Um, you know, I feel like we were one of the first people to, to, to see Zach Veen and recognize him. Ninth pick to the Rockies. Can't say enough about that kid. Tink Hentz from Arkansas. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez, you know, Noah Naylor. I mean, we, we've had some really good players that have come through. But what I remember about those kids is that they're better people. Yeah. I remember that, you know, and you know how it is when you scout, you know, when you scout and sign players, your name is linked with them forever. You know, when Josh Prince and Taylor Youngman got to the big leagues and Michael Reed, it was about, well, I signed them. Well, with this, to, to get through this, New Balance, um, which is a family company, has, has trusted me with this series to be able to select character representatives as well. Mm -hmm. And so far beyond these guys' playing careers, they're going to go be ambassadors for baseball. You're an ambassador for baseball, what you've done. Um, I like to think that I, I have to be have a responsibility to be an ambassador for baseball. And when these kids are able to do that, um, and they become young men and they pay it forward, that's so much more gratifying than the moment that they walk through our doors to start because they are going to be the ones that carry it forward. And after them, there's another group that carries it forward. And at some point, I was one of those guys that carried it forward. And you have, you have you owe it to the game. And I really believe this. You owe it to the game and everybody that's put it in with you to be the best person um, and the best ambassador you can. So, uh, you know, we've had some talent. We've had some some hefty signing bonuses go through there, uh, but I'm more proud of the young men that have that have put this logo on and, and worn it proudly. Hey, folks on Facebook, if you got any questions, type them in the comments section. Thanks for joining us. We are with Jeremy Booth. You know, Jeremy, you mentioned something there with within the the concept of evaluating and identifying players' talents for positions. I believe you said it differently. How do, how do you do that? Is it what are the uh, protocols what how do you find out what the, where that player fits the best so you know we have a um everybody knows what the five tools are right we you know run throw uh hit hit for power um you know uh what am i miss defense right feels like today we forget defense all the time maybe that's why but, but those five um you know and, and your physicality your athleticism um your lot your body life your longevity your durability all those things will help dictate what kind of role or what kind of position you'll be able to play um after that you know the first place we go to today to focus frankly is the bat right but you still got to catch the ball you got to catch the ball in the middle of the field you got to catch the ball in the corners there may be different levels of priority with those but you got to catch baseball so if i'm looking at you know x player and he's let's just say i don't know six two 190 pounds. He's got some projection to fill in. He's got some athleticism, uh, a little light with the bat, a little, you know, a little bit of length, but catches the ball. I got to figure out where I'm going to put him. And if those, uh, those tools that he does have, we can adjust and he has the aptitude to adjust to make it a skill. Because if you, if you can't play in the middle of the diamond, by that means center field, shortstop behind the plate, there's only one of those guys that can do it any one time, you got to go to the corners. And the minute you move out of those three spots, we all know you got to rake, absolutely hit. So, it puts more pressure on the bat to do that. I think we're doing this backwards and that we're just focused on the measurables now. I think, and that's going to carry instead of centering the player, which I had a, a scout I worked with, a mentor who told me what centering the player means to bring that back to what his real ability is. And that defines what position and what role. Now, sometimes it doesn't fit. Sometimes a guy can only advance to college because you know, in the pro level, we know by looking at the pro level, the tools are going to be upside down or the skills aren't going to match up or there's not going to be enough of what we call carrying tools, right? To be able to have professional value. Uh, but that's our job. Our job is to be honest with families. Our job is to help the player be the most he can, get the most out of his ability um, and trying to find a way in to have a value at every level he climbs. You know, and that's a good point because, you know, you're helping the families out. It's a perfect age to start looking into when, what position I should really start focusing on. You know, like you said, early on, have some fun, play different positions. Don't worry about it now. But as you get to that level, now you start making that decision. Now, interesting, you did mention that theories, data points, evaluation methods, some of them are flat out wrong. Um, love to just get in that discussion uh, because it is constructive criticism and it's important to understand what you mean by that. Um, 
All right. So, you know, so here, here's a good way that I, I like to easy analogy. Every year, there's guys that at 16 years old now seems they're throwing 100 miles an hour. Okay. And everybody loses their mind. Oh, man, I got to have this guy. I got to have that. If you go talk to guys in the industry, guys are making decisions. That's a concern, actually, that people are throwing that hard early. We're promoting guys that are maxed out, that won't get any more out of their ability, that, yeah, I mean, okay, maybe they have to refine it, but that's who we are calling the, the best players in the industry. That's not the case. We are focused on exit velocity now, it seems, as, as end-all, be-all. We're focused mm -hmm. on spin rate as an, an, an end-all, be-all. Well, with spin rate, to just talk about that for a second, we're talking about four-seam pitches. And for those of you that don't know what four-seam pitches are, and obviously, Peter, you do, that's a fastball, four-seam fastball, a changeup, and a curveball. Those are all four-seam pitches because they spin with four seams. Those pitches are also called, from a hitting standpoint, lift pitches. They're easy to lift, right? So if you're in your zone, because they're spinning, so you just have to hit it. If you are in your – seeing the ball well as a hitter, you'll see the ball up, you'll see the ball down, which means you're forcing a pitcher who has that type of focus on spin to throw in the hitting zone, just pitching in the hitting zone. And the minute I get you in the hitting zone, it's a lot of fun for me and not a lot of fun for you. Right. The ball's not going to do a whole lot, right? So um, we're using that as, as, as an end-all, be-all evaluation tool instead of worried about how guys use their stuff and whether or not they can get out. So that's one way. Another way is being focused only on raw power. And we see that all the time in the amateur world. And I don't know where this started, but raw power is great because it's a, it's a box to check. Man, if you can't hit, what good is that raw power? It's not that good at all, right? So we're focusing on these these tool points and we're calling them skills and they're not skills. They're just tool points. You get mm -hmm. to double A um, or at any level in baseball, at some point you're gonna find your athletic peer. I was fortunate to share the field in any number of ways, whether it was spring training or whether it was independent baseball or international um, to play with some guys that were pretty good big leaguers at one point, right? And, and that, um, and even beyond that. And this, you have to have skill refinement because you're going to meet your athletic equal. And if you don't, those tools don't have any value. You know what? And I love it that you said the skill refinement because of the fact that nowadays, again, it's constructive criticism, but nowadays, you know, especially in the, in the colder states, like where I'm at in Illinois, Midwest, we're playing a lot of games. You know, we're trying, we were trying to catch up all the time to, to California, Florida in the old days, you know, they played all year round. So we're trying to catch up. The problem is, and if you're seeing this and, and, it, and it has to attribute to some injuries too, they're not practicing that much. Um, and especially during the season, right? I mean, I might be a shortstop, you know, I'm throwing a lot of throws and all of a sudden, because I'm not keeping up my flexibility and strength, or maybe a little bit of training fundamentally, you know, now I'm starting to do things wrong. I may still get that runner out, but I may be creating some injuries. Talk about that. Um, well, that's just, that's more result focused and, and instead of, you know, process focused, right? Um, one of the benefits to living in Southern Cal, and, and of course I, I benefited with that growing up out there was we did play all the time. I mean, we did, you know, we played in the fall, we played in the spring, played in the summer. You play as a kid, you play all stars. I don't even know if they do that anymore, but you play all stars and then you'd go out and you'd play at the sand lot with your buddies. I remember we would wake up every day at 10 o'clock or say we had BP at 10 o'clock in the summertime. We'd get down and we'd throw each other BP and we'd play. We would do that all year round. Um, to your point in the colder weather states, it is the catch-up factor. It is the indoors. It is the tunnel environment, right? If you having to try to get outside um, to, to do that. And I know that when I played, the training indoors was so different from a mindset, from a, from a visual. And by the time you got outside, the whole place opened up on you and it took a minute to readjust. And I think that's what you're looking at is more of a controlled environment situation versus a, um, versus a open space situation. So um, I, you know, no, no, colder weather players have a, you know, typically pop later. And what that means is they grow into their bodies later. You know, mm -hmm. they're on a chance to play longer later. I don't know why that is, but I mean, there's good players coming out of the upper Midwest. There's good players out of the Northeast. There's good players out of the Northwest. I mean, you know, players are players and they come from everywhere, but the, the focus tends to be on finding that result. So you don't get left behind instead of trusting that process and letting it come to you naturally. If you were in charge and you were to set up a league, um, all year round, let's even say the year round, what would that look like? You know, like would, you know, so many games, a certain period, so many practices, just a general idea of how you would like to see it. So that way there's development long-term um, and not always just, you know, oriented for results of the, you know, the particular games. Well, you know, for, for, first of all, it would depend on age group. 
you know, sure. it would depend on age group and it would depend on, on, on season. I'm a big believer, as we said earlier, in other sports. You know, I know I'm in baseball and that's what we do. I'm, with I'm a you. big believer in football and soccer and basketball and whatever, you know, not just because it develops different motor skills and athleticism and different functions and what your body, because it clears your mind out. You know, it clears your mind out. I was very fortunate to play, um, you know, a couple of sports in high school and I went back out and played a little football in college as well, just because I was a little frustrated with, with baseball. So I went back out to play football, which is kind of funny. But, you know, it, it refreshed my brain. You know, Rich Gedman used to call it changing your eyes, right? It would, it would change my eyes and give me a new perspective. And, and kids need that or they burn out. So first of all, age specific is what it would have to be. Eight, nine-year-olds together, um, you know, 10 to 12-year-olds together, you know, 13 to 14. And I don't even put 15 in that category because 15 is in high school, right. right? So 13 and 14 would stay together and that's how I do it. I'd increase the number of games as they got older. Um, I wouldn't go past, frankly, I wouldn't go past... Um, you know, 45 games or so in the spring and early summer. If I was, if I'm a, you know, a, that's 10 games a month. I mean, that's enough, right? Yep. That's enough. If you start practicing in January and playing in February, you're playing February, March, April, May, and half of June. If you got to 50 games, shut it down at 13 years old. That's enough. You don't need any more than that. Go do something else for the summer. Maybe go play a different sport, pick it back up again, somewhere around where you're playing catch you know, and just keeping the interest going around, you know, let's just say, I don't know, middle of September, and then incrementally work your way back through it. So by the time you're next January, you're ready to play. Player has something to look forward to, player can build properly, um, you know, and that's just a general game schedule. Now, the higher you go, I would enhance that game number um, through the age of 17, but I'd have practices three days a week. Mm, I agree. At any, at any level, I'd have practices three days a week. And if that meant missing a game day, so be it. I'm working on base running and fundamentals and ground balls and double plays and, you know, 25 pitch bullpens that are fastballs only. And I'm going to introduce these things so that my players are having a good time with what they're doing as, as well as advancing. So when they do take the field, they can perform without any pressure on. And, and, and I want to say wins and losses because I want people to win. I think you need to learn how to win and develop at the same time but without any pressure on going four for four every day. Learn what the strikeouts mean, learn what the double plays mean, learn what the batted bats mean, reinforce that, take that back to practice, enhance the mental focus, uh, enhance the uh, understanding of what you did, even at a young age. Hey, Johnny, why did you swing at the curveball with less than two strikes, right? Because they can't throw up for two strikes at nine years old. Just stuff like that to get them to think baseball. You develop a lot better that way. By the time they're 17, they're ready to advance into college or pro ball. You know what? I agree with you, man. That's great advice, folks. And you see more kids... Um, in the U.S., obviously, um, and it, my my main concern uh, as I just watch games, and that is because you you mentioned it here. I think you said that raw talent sometimes is going unnoticed, um, and but it could be because they're not getting the right instruction. Because you don't see many baseball camps anymore. You don't see working on fundamentals. Is that why we're losing a lot the raw talent? You know, we're we're missing the raw talent. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, largely because. The, the kids that are the, the ones that carry it forward aren't the superstars at 12 years old. Right. I mean, they're all the kids, always the kids that develop later instead of the ones, you know, there's an old joke and, and I, I'm not going to say who said it is he's a VP of player personnel now in the game. But he said to me, he said, um, you know, the old rule is don't draft little league all-star. Right. I mean, don't draft a little league world series guy. Why? Yeah. Why? Well, because those kids are peaked. Usually we're peaked at 12 and that's not the ones that carry it forward, but it is the one in certain amateur circuits that we're selling. That's the kid that we're promoting and we're selling and we're leaving behind kids who have a lot to develop, but are gonna turn around and be the superstars of the game tomorrow. Um, good example, Justin Lang, 34th pick of the draft last year is in Fenway with us um, by the Padres. And, you know, Justin, when I saw him, six foot five, real loose and lanky. I mean, granted, I saw him at 16 turning 17. I didn't see him at 12, but you know, had all the markers of somebody that would be, you know, a high draft pick and, and somebody that'd be a, a major league professional. And we were just not focused on it at the time because it was short on the measurables. Mm. That's the kid ended up going 34 in the country. And he's naturally throwing hundred miles an hour now with a breaking ball at 19 years old and, and a, um, uh, and a change up might be Max Scherzer. Now we can't miss that guy. Right. You just can't miss that guy. And when you go to the um, to the, the families that don't have a ton of money, they just don't have the money to do this. They have right. a lot of talented kids because money and athleticism don't always go together. 
right? And we have to, we're missing those kids because we're making it too um, prohibitive financially to get in there. We're just walking by it. So, you know, that could kind of ties into who we're looking for, um, you know, the real translation of what the, you know, the, the, the guy throwing 100 miles an hour, what that's really going to be later, what he has to do to find that versus the kid that has to develop and grow um, and, and advance into it. So we talk about raw talent. We're walking by those guys that have to develop and, and focus on the shiny toy right now. Yeah. And how many kids are we missing? Um, because you said it earlier, when you're younger, you said, have fun, let them play other sports, do different things. But how many kids are we missing that would have continued to play the game longer that had what you're talking about more ability. They just haven't grown yet body wise or athletic wise, but we lose them because they lose interest in the sport by the, by the age 12, 13 years old, because they're not producing. I mean, if you're going to have fun, if you're a 12 year old, you're having fun. Part of that is also getting on base, right? Making an out once in a while, uh, reducing errors if possible. But if we're not really developing players at that age, at the younger levels, they're going to, they're going to stop playing before 12 years old. You know, a lot of that has to do, and, and this is going to be a very unpopular thing, but, you know, you know enough by now to know that I don't kind of say what's on my mind and we just get it out there, you know, but, you know, we, we have so much select baseball, yeah, so much travel baseball now that the pay for play component has given a sense of, I'm going to do what I want to do. It doesn't matter what lessons are going to be there. And there's so many teams that have popped up now where, again, we'll just use the name Johnny, little Johnny is going to be the shortstop because he was number three shortstop on the team he was on and that doesn't work. He's got to play. Now I understand the premise of that, but what that creates is a bunch of jumping around a bunch of kids thinking they're going to play every single inning, every single day without any consequence to how they perform. And it creates a sense of we're going to go ahead and continue to pay for these things and weed out the players that can't help us win right now. Cause I need to win right now at 10, 11 and 12, because that's what matters. Cause that's how I get other players and that's how I get seen. For everybody that could possibly listen to this in TV land, Facebook land, Twitter land, whatever. I don't care. And I feel like I'm a guy that you would want now to see your son play. And a guy that certainly in my former life, you want to see your son play. I don't care what logo you wear across your chest. I care that you can play. I don't care what team that you're with. I don't care. I care that you can play. And scouts, yes, there's an exposure component. Yes, there is a way to go about this as far as what events to do and how to navigate. And everybody, every platform out there has good things that they do. What I will say is um, jumping around from team to team doesn't help you. If you can play, stay in the system. If you're athletic, stay playing baseball because scouting community will find you. One way or the other, they will find you. Do not have to worry about um, the, the lessons of or, or not playing enough innings at nine. You have to worry about growing and developing at nine so that he does play enough innings at 15. That's when it matters. You know, Jeremy, we've talked a lot about it on the show. And, folks, we got about 10 more minutes with Jeremy. He's got another show. He's very popular. Um, you know, we talk a lot about it on the show. I mean, basically, when we're talking about it, and I address the issue of 14 and under, let's say, in that area, um, you know, we've got to do our best to give as much good information to coaches out there. Because, look, if I have a 10-year-old kid, I can send them to school. That person's got to be certified, going through an educational program. But I can send them to a travel program, which is all year round. So it's just like a school. But yet that person this is, you know, has have to have any background. Sure, some may have played pro ball or high school and college, but you know as good as I do, just because you have played it, that's a whole different ball game than coaching it. A hundred percent. You know, it's funny, I saw somebody post this on Twitter the other day. And 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 I think that we can kind of laugh about this and also think that this is a little bit sad. You know, our sport is the only one where everybody thinks they're an expert. Right. You know, if you send them to basketball, you're not hearing people questioning the, the ref's call every time we turn around. It's not happening in the football, but in baseball, man, everybody knows everything. And it's just, it doesn't matter. That's not the case. There are different what I call levels of clearance that people have achieved here. And it doesn't mean you can't learn it. it doesn't mean you can't grow into it. What it does mean is that you have to be receptive to it. People who have been in this game a long time have been humbled. If you've been in the game at a professional level, you've been humbled. If you've been in the game at college level, you've been humbled. There, there's, there's always a point where you don't, you figure out, you don't know as much as you think you do. And you start to learn a little bit more and open up and listen. And, and now, I mean, I'm at a point now where every day I try to learn something different. I always look for that, you know, what's that one new thing I'm going to see every single day, right? We have to have, to your point, travel coaches that are, and, and high school coaches and college coaches that are just receptive 
to knowledge and different concepts from people who have a different viewpoint. Listen, see it, ask about the experience, verify the experience. You are 100% correct that playing the game doesn't mean you can teach it. What it does mean, though, is that you have a little bit of a different insight into whatever level you've been at, Absolutely. right? So to not to eliminate that point of view is, is wrong. To eliminate the guy that's never played is wrong. There are ways to go about that and tie it together to merge. And that is how it works the best. Unfortunately, in this youth industry, we have lots of people, as you just said, who just don't want to listen. And if you're with somebody who doesn't want to listen to people who have done it, and I'm very grateful that there's 25 World Series rings on staff. I'm very grateful we have people who didn't play a day in the big leagues. I'm wow. grateful we have people who are good college coaches. I'm grateful we have people who didn't play at all, even in college, that can contribute to what we're doing. Um, if you don't listen to all of that, and parents, if a coach won't listen to people around him like that, you're in the wrong place. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, also, we're talking about showcases because showcases can be good, but you know, talk to parents and coaches and players, even internationally, they want to come over. Um, first of all, how do you pick a showcase? You know, how many do you do? Because, you know, it can cost you a lot of money. What's the importance, you know, maybe just background and, and even how to how when you do attend the showcase, what, you know, what to do as a player? You know, showcases uh, in the purest form are designed to, to kind of wake people up to your tools. That's all they it's really supposed to do. Um, I believe that we have gotten far too in the showcase industry and have walked away from the development component, which is why we do what we do. I'll say this, every event that a parent, the player attends needs to leave him better when he leaves than when he walked in the door, right? Mm -hmm. There's gotta be something that makes you better. It can be competition, it can be gameplay, it can be instruction, it can be measure, measuring up against it. So I, it, it's really dependent on the player. There's always gotta be something that makes you better. Um, from a cost standpoint, Anybody who charges $800 for an event, for a showcase event, I, wow. There's no reason to do that, okay? You don't have to do it that way. Um, believe me, we deal in the business component of you know experience and fanfare and media people. We have all that. You don't have to do it for 800 bucks an event. So I'm using that as an extreme. And there are companies out there that charge that. People should not just run, but sprint away from that. It's unnecessary, okay? Um, it's all, it's, it's about value, but it's also understanding that, you know, the business component of the other side, that at some point there's going to be a cutoff. And if the event gives back to you, if the event makes you better, um, and it's, it's, you can participate, you know, collectively on multiple platforms, not just ours, not just prep baseball report, not just perfect game, but multiple platforms, uh, USA baseball to, um, different sets of eyes and to enhance what you're doing. As long as it fits a budget, you can, you know, you can handle, um, and still be able to, to live a normal life, then that's how you know it's not too much. Um, there are people who have just done one. There are people who have just done USA Baseball. People have just done Perfect Game. There are people now who just do us. I encourage to do all of it if you can, right? At least a little bit to see what it's like. Maybe not stay with all of it, but a little bit to see what it's like. Um, but the cost, the cost component is to understand that, you know, and, and I hesitate to throw a number out there, but I'd say anything under $300 is usually a pretty good deal as long as it gives you A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If somebody's charging you 300 bucks for exit velocity, arm velocity in a video run, you can yes. do that yourself and put that out, you know, but if, if you're just doing, but if you're actually gonna get some, some positive work out of it, uh, major league baseball level or college level evaluation, um, and those are different, they're different, but there's things that can still advance you and you're gonna be able to find yourselves better than it's worth the investment. You know, and I remember when I was director for the Great Lakes USA Baseball and TAS Great Lake program, one of the things we told players and parents would ask, you know, because it cost a little bit of money, it wasn't expensive, $125, but, you know, they would ask and I would say, you know, if you can do it once at 11 or 12 or, you know, we're on that age group, do it because it's not about making the next team. It's about the experience aspect, right? And some kids haven't been through that tryout period. They don't see what you're being evaluated on. This will give them a good experience. Um, what about, you know, the, the other part is with showcases, and this is a concern, uh, and folks probably think I got too many concerns, but <laughs> the concern line is for Midwest kids, especially, or cold weather areas, we've got a lot of showcases that are in the winter, um, and, you know, in Florida, Arizona, and I get it, because the scouts are going, the college coaches are going, um, 
And so the players have no choice, but they have to be really careful because some of these kids are not ready. Yeah, that's the, that's the reason why we do things where it's development oriented, right? So we do things that we try to stay within a window of what I would call recovery after the regular baseball season. That's more of a build up into when they're going to play. We give up the summertime for stuff like, you know, um, when I say summer, I mean June and, and July for the most part, because we're already doing stuff. We got our national combine. We have our world combine. We have, you know, the stuff that leads into Fenway and the underclass elite, our team nationals. So we have enough things happening that summer where we want to be done with our evaluation period by June 1st. Now, we have major league people on staff. As you well know, that means we don't have to see a guy throw 95 miles an hour and know he's going to have velocity, right? We don't have to see a guy swing out with everything he has to show power. We don't need it. We just got to see how it works, how it comes together, uh, because the experience lens where we do kick into gear allows that to happen. Just having seen what turns into what, having to put your name on the line for players to, to get to the big leagues, that has something, some merit. That's tough to do. That is tough to do. So, you know, a guy like Gordon Blakely, who signed Ronald Lacuna and Gary Sanchez and David Ortiz and Luis Severino and Alfonso Soriano and Jason, Ver right? That guy's writing the reports. That doesn't hurt to have him look in there and center those kids and bring them up. So we do our stuff, developmental component, where it's a build-up, work-up schedule because exactly what you said is happening. Kids that aren't ready are going out in, I don't know, November 18th, and they're throwing as hard as they can to show up for some radar gun, and they're popping out, and they're blowing out, and they're hurting, and they're, and they're, they're destroying their bodies, and we won't be part of that. Yeah. That's happening with other groups. We won't do that. Um, so, you know, the way I would tell you to do that is pick and choose the events, again, that leave you better. Find a developmental focus, if you can, uh, in everything that you do. Otherwise, if all you if all it's going to be evaluated is your exit velocity and your spin rate and your arm velocity, you don't do the event till you're in 100 shape. Yeah, you don't do it, and even then, you do it in a controlled manner. And if they can't evaluate it, that's on them. Yeah. You don't go out and try to ask your body to do more than it can because it's the fastest way to injury. Folks, great advice. And finally, Jeremy, um, I love the part that you talk about development constantly. You know, I remember even at the NTIS, even though we did the testing, we always had development included in there, um, not just because one, it's good for the player and for the parents to see it, that you're working with the fundamentals of the athletes, but also because they're paying money. So you, you know, give them a little bit more than what you normally would give. And, and then the return is 10 times more. Finally, just some last minute advice to our players, coaches, and parents out there um, on development, anything else, and then we'll close it off. Yeah, you know, a couple of things I think we forget as part of, this ties into this conversation in about the select baseball world and being able to, um, find another team whenever you want to, right? There's some things out there that while we're chasing, I mean, I, I, mean, I can't say it's enough, championship rings and we're chasing, you know, um, toys at the end of the events. If you don't want to walk through fire to play this game, go do something else. If you're as good as ever you're going to be right now, go to something else. If you don't think, if you think the game owes you something, please go do something else, Okay. Yeah. The way this thing works is that you have to wake up every single day, two nails, spit fire, run through walls, do whatever you have to do to be as good as you can be to play this game at a high level. And if you don't, somebody else will come behind you and they will do it instead of you. And the next thing you'll find is you are sitting at home while that person's got your roster spot. So when it comes to development and it comes to focus, Follow your plan, follow the process. The one lesson a week, two lessons a week isn't enough. It has to be what you're doing by yourself when nobody's looking. You train in private so you can perform in public. And if you can follow that line, success will follow you. Unbelievable, love it. What a great way to end the show. And we're not gonna talk about it, but I'll tell you what, I, I'm worried also about these young kids not earning things. I'm seeing rings at 10 years old when you win a tournament, all kinds of you know names on the back of their caps. But that's another discussion. Hopefully we'll get Jeremy back on the show to talk even more because this was fantastic. Jeremy, I know you got another show to do. Uh, thank you, man. I appreciate the time. Hey, you know what? Thanks for having me. You had a blast. All right, folks. Jeremy Booth there. And special thank you to Jeremy. Special thanks to Brian Crock, our producer with the Lineup Media Group. And also special thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world. Thanks for joining us. Remember, just go to baseballoutsidethebox.com audio, subscribe, YouTube, Peter Caliendo. Stay safe, be healthy. God bless you. And we'll see you on the next show. See you, everybody.